Hi, I'm Randall. I'm a first time boat owner with 10,000 miles of open ocean sailing experience. I love classic boats and as a new owner, I'm more curious than ever about what goes into buying, fixing, improving, operating, and safely enjoying their magic and beauty. Join me as I talk to experts and share insights on all things related to older sailboats. If you're interested in affordable ways to get out sailing, you are in the right place. Today, I'm tagging along with Jim, a veteran surveyor, to chat about DIY tips on an old sailboat and what you can look for before you hire a surveyor. In our last visit with Jim, he gave us some great DIY tips related to the hull and items below the waterline. Today, we're headed up topsides above the waterline to look at fiberglass, decks, chain plates, and a whole bunch more. Hi, I'm Jim Dias from Accredited Marine Surveyors, and I have the pleasure of working with Rand Day, who you know from the channel. And I, I and, and Randy is really, really good at getting me to explain things effectively. And so I need things broken down as for a simpleton. No, it ain't quite <laughs> true. As a person who's watching these videos and thinking about buying a boat, one of the things that you may come up against in that process is things that you don't know. And so you should feel free on contacting the channel uh, and or me. And if we can help guide you in any way, well, both of us would certainly be happy to. Yeah, so, so like throwing a comment down below is super helpful. It gives us a little bit of direction about what questions you might have. We've seen a bunch already pop up that were interesting that were uh, about swing keels, which is something we'd love to take a look at, right? Right, right. Uh, and I think a lot of people would benefit from that, especially if you're just getting into sailing. Swing keels, trailerable boats, those are a great starter boat to do. So yeah, yeah. if we can answer some of those questions of like what to look for if you're gonna buy one, throw comments down below. Let us know what you're thinking, or we also have a special email, which is askjim at yachthunting.com. And then, of course, if you're more serious about uh, a boat surveying work, feel free to call Jim at Accredited Marine Surveyors, and his information is here on the screen and also beneath the video. So, Let's get uh, it. You know, one of our questions we got was about your moisture meter. They wanted to know what model and all that. Well, this particular one is a little different. It's a GE Protometer. Um, the difference between this one and many moisture meters that you may have seen before is that it uses radio interferometry to measure moisture by virtue of the dispersion of the radio waves through the structure that you're attempting to measure moisture in. You know, more resistance to dispersion of the radio waves would indicate more moisture. Yep. And so it's shown in a, a quantitative way here, a uh, quantitative way here, easy for me to say. Um, <laughs> or is it? On the, uh, on the screen, which is relative, you know, obviously a lot of moisture in a hand. You moisturized today? Yeah, I moisturized, that's exactly right. We do have a boat here, and I thought we'd pick up kind of where we left off, which I'm curious, what do you look at top sides? Yeah, that's the next step, yeah. All right, why don't we head up and uh, check it out? Yeah, good idea, let's go. Fiberglass boats today have to be marked with a hull identification number. Sure. And it's almost always in the upper right hand corner. The last two numbers indicate the year of construction of the boat. The other numbers indicate the model, the year the hull and the model sure. was laid up and all. But a lot of times a guy will tell you you're buying a 2016 boat, which is actually 2013, 14, 15 maybe. And so as you climb up on that boat and look, you can see that number, it'll tell you. Good to know. Every time you use a ladder to climb on a boat, always tie the ladder off when you get to the top and be very careful going up the ladder when you do. It can fall over because the boat yards are either asphalt or gravel or the ladders are good and have decent feet or they don't. And at the top of the boat, they only can lean against so much and it's smooth and slick. And if you go up a ladder and you don't tie it off, there's a good chance that the ladder can slide out from under you and you can fall from 8, 10, 12, 15 feet in the air and land in a pile on the ground. The second thing to notice on these boats is that there's always lifelines of some kind. And so if you can find a place either on the transom where the push pit has got an opening or the side of the boat where there's an opening in the lifelines, put the ladder there so you can open the lifelines. You don't have to try to climb over them to get on deck because staying on the boat and not falling off the boat is as important as staying on the ladder and not falling off the ladder. 
right, so we're up in the cockpit and there's a lot of stuff going on. So where do I start? The first thing I would do when I got on a boat was just make note of how well organized things are. The cockpit lockers can have gear that's beautifully stowed that'll tell you if the guy's orderly, the person who owns the boat, it can also tell you what kind of equipment's on the boat that would be readily accessible and used. So if, for example, there's fenders and orderly lines in the cockpit, well, you know that the guy ties up and needs his lines where he wants them and needs to be able to get them. If there's just old barbecue grill and a couple of propane bottles that are rusting away in here, you know the person doesn't know that you can't keep propane in a locker that drains to the bilges and or rusty equipment. Just tells you somebody's not taking care of stuff. So that's a pretty quick and dirty way. Just open that locker up and see what you got. I, we haven't opened these lockers. Oh. <laughs> should no, we open I'm them? A, I'm a little afraid. <laughs> yeah, we like, let's get a shot, man. There we go. Okay. Well, somebody's doing some fishing. <laughs> we got a guy that sails, loves to fish. We've got very little in the locker. This is, after all, a boat for sale, so we don't know if they, people have taken a lot of their things off. Um, battery, yep. strapped and secured in a box so that it doesn't move, and the positive and negative terminals don't get shorted out by other things that are falling into the locker. Kind of important, so somebody thought about that. The next thing I always look at is the running rigging. And so you what do you see... mean by running rigging? What, what does that encompass? Oh, there's two types of rigging on a sailboat, right? Standing rigging the mast and the spars and the chain plates and all those wires, and the running rigging, which is the line that controls the sails and hauls up the main or the jenny, and okay. all those things are referred to as running rigging. And those lines are sometimes older and chafed and UV damaged. Yep. And so you're gonna be replacing some running rigging, not that it's the most expensive thing, but it does tell you if somebody's generally keeping up on the boat. Right. So it's one of those items. And then the next stop I would do, uh, in a, normally just in a walkthrough, would be look at the anchor locker to see what kind of ground tackle he's got. And is the chain good? Are the thimbles good? Are the shackles attached adequate? Is there enough line to be able to secure the boat in 20, 30, 50 feet of water yep. with enough road to give the boat some uh, catenary so that it can stay put? Oh. All right, so. In the event that you have to deploy an anchor quickly, you want your chain and road able to be able to flake out easily, not disorganized. And so this, you can see, is kind of a mess. There's no windlass, so whoever is going to be deploying an anchor on this boat is going to have to get this Bruce anchor up and under here, the chain overboard, and then the rope cinched up and set up on the cleat. Any individual component of the setup of the anchor, chain, uh, shackles, etc., can be a weak link. So we've got a small shackle here, a larger rusted one here, and a captive uh, uh, pin that's rusted in place. This is a weak link, theoretically, in an anchoring situation because of the wear that takes place here and the corrosion that we can see that might be worse inside where that pin is is inserted into the shackle. So I like to have clean uh, ground tackle that I can depend on. Some people don't care quite so much about it, yep. but it tells me a little something about the housekeeping of the boat right. by seeing this. Yep. So if you bought this boat, new shackle, clean up the anchor, yeah, chain. definitely new shackle and a swivel and, and make sure my line could pay out a little further. He's got plenty of road. Yeah. But um, could play out more easily, maybe. Yeah. What's your uh, favorite style of anchor? Oh, you know, whatever holds. Because <laughs> the next <laughs> one goes, that one doesn't hold, the next one goes in the water. <laughs> uh, yeah, nowadays, I guess the, the spade anchors are really kind of dependable. They reset. Yeah. yeah. Really quickly, yeah. um, where sometimes something like a Danforth can catch some grass on it and have trouble resetting. Right. Um, a CQR on a harder bottom will want to skid along a little. Yep. So the plow type anchors and the Danforth style anchors can have environments that are not as good for them to get a hold of. And the, the spades seem to kind of bridge some of those yeah, yeah. Uh, difficult holding situations and find themselves getting in. I noticed the cockpit locker seats are 
pretty flexible. Yeah, you know, you're going to find moisture in different small uh, moldings like the cockpit seat locker lids, the anchor locker lid, um, sometimes hatches, but not normally, um, uh, and the deck, usually around the chain plates. But we can check right here. We're here right now. Oh yeah, okay. So let's let's give it a shot. Let's see what we got. I'll step up. Oh, you're getting a trained ear here. Yeah, you tell yeah. you tell me. All right, anywhere. That's a, that's a D flat. All right, so oh, yeah, okay. it's not bad as it could be. Yeah. We're in that 200 range. Sometimes where there's a screw hole through, things will come up higher, but this is a pretty dry anchor locker lid. When you get to the chain plates on a sailboat, it's an area of the boat that is really highly stressed. The wire of the standing rigging is under tension by turnbuckles that are pulling it tight to hold the mast up. So this piece of equipment here is under tension with the wires. The mast base itself, or the mast step, and on this particular boat, it's a deck stepped mast. It suffers from compression load damage. But either one of them, the compression from here or the tension from here causes flexing in the hull of the boat to some extent and consequently stress on the deck from the tension and loss of tension on the change of tacks and the compression from the mast almost consistently. You can hear if the deck laminate sounds solid. If it's solid, there's a good chance that the chain plates have not let moisture in where they pass through the deck, which has rotted out the core in the deck or caused moisture to penetrate the core. Same thing on the mast base or the mast step. You mentioned something to me, I think the other day, about the angle of the screws. The one that had a slight angle to it, you know, five degrees off from vertical. Right. What would that indicate to you? What you're talking about is an issue and an important one. Yeah. In this particular installation, it's not because this chain plate and its bedding plate are one item. They're welded together yeah. and inside the boat, we're gonna find a backup flange beneath it that those are, are not screws, those are actually okay. bolts. But when you do see the screws that you're talking about, what they do is they hold down what are called bedding plates. And the bedding plates hold the bedding against the chain plate and in to the opening in the deck that they had to cut so that the chain plate could pass through it. Right. And now you want to put a bedding plate around that and bedding so that water doesn't seep down the edges of the chain plate and get yeah. inside. So the beautiful thing about those screws is that you unscrew those pieces of metal, yep. you know, the bedding plates, you can lift them up yep. and then get new bedding in underneath, yep. drop them down and re-screw them. Yep. And what you're referring to can happen when the screw hole over time has become elongated and the screw can't go in right. anymore straight. And it's trying to hold that bedding plate in position, yep. but it, there's no more thread in the whatever structure right. might be, fiberglass or core. Yep. So yeah, it means that can move, that means that can let water in and then damage the deck, yep. damage the bulkheads, yep. yeah. Oh. Right, dead. Yeah. Can you hear the deadness in yep. there? Yep, echo. Yep, hard. Dead. Oh, yeah. So water has gotten in through the chain plate bedding place. Remember you're talking about your screws being at the wrong angle? Yep. Because they just can, couldn't bite anymore? So that's a chain plate bedding plate. The chain plate bedding plate keeps the bedding compound around the chain plate because this deck has a slot cut in it where the chain plate itself, this metal piece here, passes through to the inside of the boat and is fastened to various components inside to bear the load of the rig. And in order to keep the water out of that, you put a bunch of bedding compound around that slot and then you press it down with this plate. And you can see the screw holes here were designed to do that. But over time, they move from rig movement and tension and water seeps in. And when it does seep in, it starts to track through the different parts of the balsa core and get trapped in there and then the balsa core rots out and it essentially becomes dust black dust when it's bad and this one's real bad so if we cut a hole here 
and looked at that balsa core, it would essentially be friable yep, next to black. nothing. So let's see how bad it is. Maybe it goes all the way up to the camera there. Let's try. It's pretty bad. Yeah. Pretty bad. How about how far off? Let's see. This deck is shot. Yeah. It's shot. Yep. It's not gonna it's not gonna give you that compressive strength that it needs across the shear line of the bond between the core and the skin. That's why this boat hasn't sold. It's too much to fix. Right. How's the roof? That sounds okay. That's better, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Remember we talked about the mass step and the mass partners having moisture get in them sometimes? Yep. yep. And see the crazing over there by you? Yep. So this could be bad here too. Any other spots for leaking that you worry about? Like, do you think about the port lights or uh, some of those connections or deck to hull flanges? Um, do you think about those? Well, yeah, you do. On this particular hull, it's an outward turning flange. So the deck itself, when they manufactured it, had a lip and they bolted through those two lips and then they put this railing through it and uh, bolted through it and made it very, very strong. It's an inward turning flange where the actual like hull place. comes up this way, right, and then the deck sits down on it. Yep. And they reinforce that area where the hull radiuses into that inner flange okay. so that that's kind of a strong angle beam. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And then when the deck sits on it and it's bed to it and through bolted to it, it's very strong. Yep. And most boats are built that way. Yeah. Not all, but. Yeah, yeah. An outward turning flange is. When you're building a boat in a production facility, it's much easier to put things together from the outside of the boat. So if you make an outward turning flange, that railing goes on, the bolts go through, you're on a set of sawhorses all along the boat or a, yeah. uh, a platform, and you assemble the hull and deck together. An inward turning flange, now you have to have somebody inside yep. through bolting. It's much more prone to leak. Yep. It's very strong, but there's more labor involved in doing it that right, way. Right. But because it's so strong, that's why we've done it. What a lot of us don't own, always think about is that we assume that the deck is to support us and not to buckle under our feet to give us a better place to walk. In fact, from a design point of view, that's not why <laughs> the deck is important. It's because of the sheer property of the deck, in other words, the strength across the deck that is accomplished through the use of the external hull skin, the core material, which in this case is balsa wood, and the internal hull skin attaching to each other. And that load that you put down on that external hull skin is borne in shear across the surface of the core. So when a boat has a rigging loop that wants to pull the boat together like this, the shear strength of the deck resists that. And that's why we have balsa core in or other coil materials to give the deck sheer strength yeah. for the support of the rig. Yeah. So we can show your viewers how it sounds where the core is good, and we'll probably find some places, okay. and they can sound where the core is bad. Okay. It's pretty bad. Yeah. Too. Yep. All around there. Yeah. Let's put the moisture meter on it. Let's see what we got. All right, so we didn't have it here yet. This is a surprise moisture meter reading. <laughs> All right, green shows like 101, which is just a reference number. But if we move closer to that dead sound, watch what the numbers do. You see the red part of the oh, meter? Wow. Showing up that red line? That's a lot of moisture in there. And I would be surprised if we got it right up to 900 here. We're up there, 400, 500. So this is essentially all wet in here. Water got in through these bolts into the core, migrated because of gravity and the natural inclination of wood to suck moisture up, which is what keeps trees alive. And it's just started to deteriorate the core to the point where that now we've got very wet decks that are no longer doing their job. 
And no matter how much bedding compound they put around here, the structure of the deck underneath that mass collar is, is shot. There's, it's just going to move around. There's nothing yeah. holding things together. Right. Boats to walk away from. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah, should be so the title. Deal breaker, right? I yeah. mean, oh, come for, on. for a boat of this and you know, value. Can you see this? Right? Oh, yes. Can you actually I mean, see this? There is, there's no core left. That's just fiberglass skin compressing under the weight of the boat shoe. So there's nothing in there anymore. So is this a boat that's going to end up in the chop shop? Yep. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's bound for the dumpster. Like, yeah. yeah. Too bad. So that's the worst case scenario right there, boy. You're living it. Let's see what we got on the anchor locker lid. That's another place they go bad. We did that on the other boat. But this one may also be bad. We don't know. This one's good. Oh, whoa. But the deck's not, huh? <laughs> wow. Okay. Sorry, viewer. <laughs> it's a I mean, sad if you story. climb the ladder and you get on a deck on a boat like this, just be very careful climbing down. <laughs> yeah, That's pretty much yeah. what you're going to be doing. Sad day. Oh, it's so bad, Randy. People still sail these boats, but what happens is inside, the, the stresses that can no longer be borne by the deck are borne by the tabbing of the bulkhead into the internal skin of it or an internal liner. So the boats don't fall apart, but they start to deform yeah. because there's no longer any strength in, in the core and the skin. And first of all, you can't tension your rig up much because the boat's just going <laughs> to yeah. fold up on you. you yeah. know? So that, that thwart chips and, and fore and aft load, uh, that's sheer strength of yeah. that. that deck core is vitally important to keep the boat in one piece. What I have seen is boats where the rig tension has been pumped up so bad on racing yeah, boats sure. that they've actually fractured internal components in the boat because oh, of the wow. strength in a, of the hydraulics yeah. pumping those yep. rigs up to the point where the head stay has got to be crazy, crazy tight yep. and then the boat can't take it and then it actually causes deck skin and core to start coming apart because of the torsional loads yeah, on it. sure. So yeah, it can happen. But when you can see it moving, you know there's no structural integrity there, so. Make a great terrarium. <laughs> In our next visit with Jim, we'll go over his tips for what to look for when it comes to standing rigging, steering controls, cockpit gear, and a few other things topsides. Feel free to drop a comment down below the video or shoot us an email to askjim at yachthunting.com. And if you're serious about needing a survey, feel free to reach out to Jim at Accredited Marine Surveyors. His information is listed here. And I'll also put the information below the video. And of course, thanks again to our Patreon sponsors for all of your support. Without your help, this production really wouldn't be possible. So really appreciate it. Thanks so much.